Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Real world experiences enhance a Cedarville education. Minister to children at an area hospital. Teach at a local school. Start a business. Students prepare for success with authentic firsthand experiences. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. All right, today, I'll, obviously, we're going to take a look at Daniel, but it's going to be the first of two parts of Daniel. Uh, next time we get together, we will take a look at the prophecies and the eschatology and the future stuff, and there's a whole bunch of that. But today, we're just going to take a look at uh, the stories and the message uh, historically that it was uh, talking about. But in order to do that, it's kind of nice to set the background with a little bit of walkthrough. And I wonder if you can remember the walkthrough. You think you could do it with me one more time? Okay, let's, uh, let's give it our best shot. Get your fingers ready to go. Stretch them out there. On your mark, get set. Genesis chapter 1 is? Creation. Pretty good, a lot better than 9 o'clock. Uh, chapter 2 is? Special, special events of creation. Chapter 3, the fall of Adam and Eve. Chapter 4, Cain and Abel. Chapter 5, genealogy. 6, 7, and 8, Noah and the? Blood. Chapter 9, Noah. After the blood. Chapter 10, very good. Chapter 11 is the? Tower of Babel. Chapter 12 is the? Call of Abraham. Wow, this is so much fun. <laughs> So much better. I'm so discouraged after 9 o'clock. Yes, uh, 12 is the call of Abraham. God calls Abraham out of Ur. Ur. He says, pack your Back. walk around the, to the land I promised to give. give to you. There he has give. sons. First one is not son of promise. Name is? Ishmael. Second one is name is? Isaac, Isaac also has. Jesus. First one is not name is? Esau. Second one is name is? Jacob, Jacob has. Twelve they all go down to the land of Egypt. where they stay for till God raises up a leader named Moses. goes to Pharaoh and says let my people go Pharaoh says to him no way Moses God brings and 10 plagues. plagues Moses leads them through the Red Sea and into the wilderness, wilderness where they get the bright idea of sending out those spies two of which come back and say yes, yes. 10 come back and say no people say no God says no. very good <laughs> so everybody dies off over the next 40 years till God raises up a new leader named who leads people through the Jordan. Jordan and divides the land up into 12 sections. Yeah, now we're ruled by people called Judges. judges. Lasts for 400 years, a series of ups and downs. People say, man, we're tired of this. What we really need is a uh, first king's name is and then and then very good. Solomon dies. Whole thing is cut in two. Number of tribes north are 10 and two. The capital up here is Samaria and down here is Jerusalem. The country up here is Israel and Judah. Very good. That lasts for a couple hundred years until the land up here is called Assyria. The year is 722. King comes down, grabs the northern ten tribes, carries away into captivity, never to be Very good. Over here, this country is now called Babylon. The year is 586. King Nebuchadnezzar comes around, smashes the temple flat, grabs the two and the remnant of the ten, and carries them away under captivity where they stay for 70 years. This is the time of the prophet Daniel, right? At the end of this time, God raises up two leaders. The first one is priestly. His name is Joshua. The second one is royal. His name is He comes back and rebuilds the temple out of all that. Very good. 70 years later, God raises up. Rebuilds all the 400 years later, Messiah comes. Gosh, you guys have restored my faith. <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. Well done. Really, really well done. Okay, so that kind of sets us up for these 70 years over here with Daniel, all right? Now, let me say that what I'm about to do for you is sort of a veggie tale thing, and it's going to seem uh, kind of silly and superfluous, but trust me, it's 98% serious. So, do not miss it. Everything about this silly little song from Larry is significant and uh, it will translate into direct meaning. So listen to it carefully, even though it's a little silly, okay? So here's the situation. 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar comes over and smashes everything flat, makes that temple into rubble, right? So I'm a little um, eight-year-old kid and I see that happen and I'm carried, uh, carried away off over here to Babylon, 
And so uh, now, uh, in my sandbox, I don't make sand castles. I, as a little Jewish kid, make sand temples, right? So I do that, and so I'm building up my little sand temple, got it all built here just as happy as can be. It just really looks beautiful, it's marvelous. Reminds me of the glory of what Solomon had built and what we left back there behind. It got all destroyed. And my trouble is, my little buddy, Billy, the Babylonian, comes along and smashes my sand temple, right? Now I'm really ticked at this. I say, Billy, you can't do that. Can to, cannot, can to, and we go back and forth. And I say, come on, man, what makes you think you can just destroy my sand temple like that? He says, come on, my, our, our God's bigger than your God. They said, how do you figure that? He says, come on, do I have to explain this to you? I mean, everybody knows this. Our army beat your army. Our God smashed your God's house, so our God is bigger than your God. And I'm thinking, well, I never heard that before. I don't like it, but it kind of sounds, you know, like he's got a point, and so I do whatever he eight-year-old kid does, I, I run home to mom. I say, mom, mom, help me out here. <laughs> Billy came over and he smashed my sand temple and he said, worse than that, he said, his God is bigger than our God and that's not true, is it, mom? No, okay, good, I didn't think so. <laughs> now, mom, why? What do I say to Billy? He said, their God smashed our God's temple so their God was bigger, but it's not true, so how come? D do you want me to go ask Aunt Sarah? Okay, Aunt Sarah? <laughs> Hey, Sarah, Billy, he smashed my temple, and it was really good, and, and he said his God was bigger, and I know it's not true, so Aunt Sarah, how come? Sometimes God allows stuff to happen, you don't know why. Sometimes God allows stuff to happen, you don't know why. Aunt Maddie, is that true? Yes. <laughs> so we don't know why, it just, it just kind of happens, and we don't know any better? We disobeyed. We, dis we disobeyed? Oh, so tell me more. <laughs> We disobeyed, so. So the curses from. So the curses Deuteronomy. from Deuteronomy. Oh, wow. Hey, Manny, she knows stuff. <laughs> the curses from Deuteronomy came true, and so it wasn't that their God was bigger than our God, it's just that he was being faithful to his promises. That's really good. Okay, I'll go back. I'll tell Billy that. Okay. Right. So, so I go back. And the next day, right, the next day I build my sand temple up and it's really good and I'm so excited. And Billy comes along again and smashes and says, Billy, you can't do that. He says, come on, we've been through this. Our God's bigger than your God. No, 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 he's not. The reason why your God smashed our God's house was because our God, even though he's more powerful, was being faithful to the promises where he said to us, if we continually disobeyed, he would kick us out. And that's the reason our temple got smashed. And Billy looks at me and says, yeah, whatever. That's what everybody says. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, you know, our country has destroyed over 30 temples, and that's true. And every time it happens, the people who get defeated have this lame excuse, well, it was just because they were disobedient. We've heard that all, all before. But it doesn't speak our language, and it's not true, and it's like it's a lame excuse from people who have nothing better. Now, is this really... An important situation and the answer is absolutely it is and here's the reason why because what happens over here in Jerusalem where Israel's temple gets smashed is like the dysfunction of this family up until this point for the last 200 years has kind of been kept within the house right but and, and nobody really knows what's going on but now the temple gets smashed and all of a sudden Israel gets exiled and all of the rest of the world then is kind of privy to this and now all of a sudden the rest of the world looks and says well maybe Yahweh isn't uh, as great as they thought he was and he was just another God who could be conquered and that and that message is not just happening here in the sandbox but it's happening in the marketplaces in the boardrooms and everywhere and even though it is absolutely true that God is being faithful, you can understand that in this worldview over here in Babylon, that just feels like kind of a lame answer, and, and we need a better answer than what we have so far. So if you, if you can catch that, let, let me say it explicitly here, and let's talk about the book of Daniel, my God's bigger than your God, and where, where this comes from in the culture. So... Uh, I'll give you a crash course in Babylonian theology. Actually, you just got it and may not have recognized it, but it was absolutely true. Here is the worldview that's expressed by Billy in the sandbox. Many gods exist, right? This is what everyone takes to be absolutely true. A priori knowledge, you don't even have to prove it. Many, many gods exist. And the gods vary in power. Some are more powerful than others. 
And so the more powerful the God, the more he can empower his army. So that we, we've encountered this a little bit before when we talked about uh, Hezekiah and Sennacherib, if you remember that whole story, how Sennacherib came down and couldn't quite destroy the temple of Yahweh, right? So how he would go back and spin that in his hometown. And so when you have two gods that are fighting, like in this case, Mr. Red God and Mr. Yellow God, they both have power that extends out like a cell tower, right? And the question, the question here is, if Mr. Yellow God can take the battle to Mr. Red God right at his home and destroy his home at the fringes of Mr. Yellow God's power, and he's more powerful than Red God is on his home turf, then game over, right? If, in fact, you can do this, it's an absolute uh, winner. Right? You, you have, you've won the argument. So because of this, military victories and defeats are ultimately very spiritual experiences. So that Billy can say, our God's bigger than your God because our army beat your army, and it's all about the power of the God behind the army. So a little applied Babylonian theology then, ABT 101, what Billy would say and what his mom would say and what his aunt and uncle would say is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple clearly prove that, God, that the God of Babylon is bigger than Yahweh. And it's just a matter of course. So the response then of Jewish theology, JT 2730, get it? 2730, get it? <clears throat> the response is this. The destruction of Jerusalem was not because Yahweh was weak. Rather, it was his faithfulness in punishing a disobedient people. And that's absolutely true. In fact, you could point to at least three source books that we've studied that would teach that kind of thing. So in order of chronology, or maybe even importance, what books would you look to that would teach this is true? First one would be at least, that would be Deuteronomy, right? And then other ones we've looked at so far. A little review for the final exam here. Jeremiah is going to do it for us too, right? Jeremiah says, because of the conscious, continuous, deliberate rejection of Yahweh, the people forced God to follow through with his promises, and so he does. And then, of course, Kings teaches us this with the stories of Manasseh and, um, and Solomon. Those are the things which led to the destruction uh, of the temple. Now, <clears throat> the response then, or the counter-response of Babylonian theology to this is, <laughs> yeah, whatever, right? That's what everybody says. And again, you can understand that even though we understand that this is true, right, What's, what's actually going on over here in, this, in Babylon, where the language spoken is a language of power, that just falls absolutely flat, right? It sounds like an incredibly leak, weak and lame argument. And so, God's counter response then, and there needs to be one to this, is in fact the book of Daniel. Daniel speaks to, to places where Kings and Deuteronomy and Jeremiah can't. And what the book of Daniel is going to say is this, number one, Daniel answers the question, is Yahweh weak? And it does it for people who are not God's people. For people who are going to listen to Deuteronomy and Kings and, and, and other books and say, well, that doesn't really relate or we don't, we don't buy that argument. This is going to be written for people who understand the language of power. Right? Now, it is true, Jeremiah answers the question for God's people, whose fault was the exile? And believers understand this. But Daniel is in a separate class. Daniel is going to speak for people who are not God's people in a language which they can understand literally. And we'll talk about that in a second. Right? So right here, let's talk about those languages. So we're going to take a look. We're going to look here actually at structure, as we always do when we look at a book. And the most interesting part about structure here is the languages which are used. And that's because... For the very first time in all of the Old Testament, we have a book other, I mean, we have a language other than Hebrew. And you'll notice here the, the, the kings at the top, Nebuchadnezzar, then Belshazzar, then Darius, then Belshazzar, and Darius, and Cyrus again, uh, and the chapters. But notice that on the third row here, Hebrew is in the first chapter, and then chapters 2 to 7 are Aramaic. Again, 8 to 12 reverts back to Hebrew. Now, what in the world is going on here? Well, let me show you. If you take a look at the world map, the people who speak Hebrew are in this little yellow section, right? That's it. Guess what they speak elsewhere? 
Aramaic, everywhere, right? This is the lingua franca. This is the trade language. This is what everybody else speaks besides people. I mean, they, they all have individual languages, but everybody around here speaks Aramaic. So that when you come back here and you take a look at this chart, you realize, wow, all of a sudden in chapters two to seven, God is speaking the language that Babylonians understand, not only literally, but also figuratively in terms of power. And now all of a sudden, God is not just speaking to me or to my mom or to my aunt or uncle or whatever. God is speaking to Billy. You with me here? And Billy's mom and dad and Billy's aunt and uncle and everybody who can hear. So uh, let's take a look at what God says in Aramaic and in Hebrew. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of work our way through the stories as we have often done, especially in the book of Judges. And uh, I want you to connect the dots to put it all together. So I'm going to give you some background. I'm going to point out some highlights in the text. But I'm not going to give you the answer to what all the stories actually mean. It's too important for me just to tell you the, tr the, the, the answer, right? I want you to figure it out. So pay attention and ask yourself, here's some clues. What is the only common thread in all the stories? For example, is it the concept of faith? Because in this book, we're going to find an awful lot about people who believe in some really, really good stories of faith. Um, is Daniel the, the common thread in all the stories? After all, the book is named after him. Is it good Jewish people? We find a lot of those besides Daniel. Is it dumb kings? We got those in abundance. Um, or is it the same audience? Because the audience is mentioned, interestingly. Or is it something else? What is, what is the common thread in all the stories? All right. So let's, let's begin then, uh, first chapter. This is still written in Hebrew because this is written for God's people. And you'll remember what we said when we talked about interpretive narrative. When interpreting stories, what is the thing you always look for first? You look for a caption, right? You look for a statement that tells us what these stories mean. And right here in the very beginning, take a look at how it starts. In the third year, in the reign of Jehoiakim, King of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Uh, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Boom. So right there, right? Right there it tells us what this book is about, is about what happened over here in Jerusalem to God's house. Now, to us, right, we tend to think, oh, well, it's just a building, right? And the answer is, no, 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 no. The temple is God's house. The temple is symbolic of God's people, of God's covenant, of God's power. It is everything. Do not think of this as just a structure. Think of this as the place where God lives. And so what is it saying? What it's saying is that the reason why Nebuchadnezzar besieged it and was able to take the house was not because Yahweh was weak, because it was the Lord who delivered those things into his hand. Now, for you and I and for everybody else who is Jewish, who understands Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Kings, this is, enough, this is enough for us, but it's not enough for Billy. So this is where it starts, but it's going to go far beyond this. Right? So uh, there's the story of the introduction, kind of the caption that helps get us started. But then I want to talk a little bit about Daniel himself. Again, chapter 1, written in Hebrew. And this is the place where that famous verse shows up. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food. So he asked for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, uh, it's always a great lesson to think ahead, to purpose in your heart, to imagine the situation of temptation is coming so that you can adequately meet it or avoid it or whatever the best solution to it is. But one want to come on and drill down just a little bit and say, well, now what was it specifically that would be defiling about the food? Can you answer that for me? Why is it that Daniel decided to eat only veggies and not meat? The, the meat might have been offered up to God. Certainly the wine was offered up to God's, and that's, that's on, the, on the right track, but keep going. There, there are more reasons, too. Yeah. Uh, it, could have, it could have been non-kosher, right? It could have been unclean, according to Leviticus. And even if it was lamb, which might have been clean meat, if the blood hadn't been drained out of it properly, it wouldn't be clean for him to eat. So you can't trust the pagan chef no matter what the meat is, the only safe way to go is with a vegetable because you can't have any, there's no such thing as an unclean vegetable, right? So he just eats unclean vegetables and water, which no one poured out in honor of their gods. So he's still staying Levitically pure. Now imagine how difficult that may have been 
or put yourself in the same temptation, right? You're 500 miles away from home. Mom and dad are not around. Your pastor, your priest is not around. And you say to yourself, wow, that bacon smells good. I've always wondered, right? You can imagine. And Daniel says, no, no, no. No, even though we live in a foreign land, we're following the law. We're, we're going to honor God. And so, again, he's a really upstanding guy here. Now, the thing that always amazed me about this is that uh, all he's going to eat is vegetables. I never, I, was, I never could figure out how VeggieTales deals with that fact, but <laughs> some, somehow they do. Right? So uh, at the end of these 10 days, of course, they are smarter. God gave them knowledge. God supernaturally did this for them. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds, which comes in pretty helpfully uh, in chapter 2 and beyond. So let's move on then to the middle section, 2 to 7, which is about Yahweh's superiority over the nations, demonstrated first of all in this dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So let's begin here, verse 2. The king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him the dream. Now, um, in our culture, when we look at that crowd, it's kind of a wacky crowd in some sense. A magician, an enchanter, uh, you know, maybe an entertainer. But to them, these words would not have that kind of connotation. What, what category would you put on this audience to whom he's speaking? What kind of crowd is this? Can you see the category from their worldview? What kind of people are these? Laura? They're intelligent people? Wise, keep going. Like spiritual people. Yeah, this is the religious crowd here, right? These are the people who are supposed to know God. Intelligent people, they're people who are supposed to be able to give you really deep spiritual answers. That's who he thinks he's talking to. And so he says, of course, you know the background. I have a dream that troubles me. I want to know what it means. So notice the words in verse 4. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, right? So from this point on, everything's written in Aramaic. Right? So we step over here back to our sandbox and say, okay, Billy, are you listening? Right? This is written for Billy. Right? So, uh, o, o king, live forever, tell your servants a dream, and we will interpret it. You understand, of course, that the, tr the, the urgent part of this whole story is the king says, no, 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 I'm not going to tell you the dream because I don't trust you guys. You tell me what dream I had, and then I'll know if your interpretation is valid. And not to put any pressure to it, but, you know, if you don't, you're going to be cut in pieces and your houses turn into piles of rubble. Now, the one thing you can't say about Nebuchadnezzar is that he utters empty threats because he's ready. In fact, he does. He does send out the threat to kill all of them when they can't come up with the answer. But Daniel saves the day, and we'll see that in a minute. So the astrologers say, hey, this is, this is not really very fair. Uh, there's not a man on earth who can do this kind of thing, and nobody can reveal it to the king except the gods, and hey, small problem, they don't live among men. What are we going to do? This is unreasonable, right? So he says, okay, that's it. Off with all of you. <laughs> we don't need any of you. Let's just kill all of them because you're no good anyway. And so the message gets to Daniel, and Daniel says, hold on, I, I can answer this. And so he comes, and he says the very same thing they do. That is, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain this to the king, but, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and let me tell you what they mean. Now, at this point, he talks about the content of the dream. I don't want to talk about the day, that today. We'll talk about that a little bit next time. Right now, I just want to take a look at the whole sort of literary bottom line of the story. And so Daniel does reveal to him the dream, and at the end of it then, verse 47, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries you're able to reel this mystery, right? Now, that's, that's, the, that's the end of it. Now, notice, notice who says this final line in the whole story. Right? Is it Daniel? No, no, no. It's not Daniel, right? This is the king. Now, do you understand why, how, how important that is? I mean, if we want to brag about our track team, right? Hey, we won first place, and the last place you go to is our coach, right? The coach is supposed to be biased. What you really want is the coach of some other team to say, wow, no, it's, it's absolutely true. Those people are the best, right? And so here you've got the words coming from the king. This is incredibly important because this is going to play really well over here in the sandbox. I'm building up my sand temple. I got it just the way I want it. Old Billy the Babylonian comes along. Mm, I said, Bill, you can't do that. He says, come on, we've been through this. I said, no, you can't. 
He says, why not? I say, because my God is the God of gods and the King of kings. Who says? You see? Your king. Your king is the one who said that, right? Don't be messing with my temple because your king said, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. So leave my temple alone, all right? Well, I don't know about that, but okay. For this time, you get a pass, right? Okay, that's great. Let's take a look at the second story. The second story, of course, is the golden image. We all know about the, this uh, 90 feet high thing they have to bow down to. And notice, first of all, the audience. So this one's a little bit easier. Satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates. So how would you characterize this crowd? This is the government, right? This is the governmental officials. First we have the spiritual guys. Now we got the government officials. And they come along. And um, so the king says, is it true? The three of you guys, you're not going to bow down and worship the image I have set up. He says, if you don't do this, what in the world God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Right? A perfect setup to the story. And so they say, look, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown in the furnace, God will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Now, I love that because... It's, it's a really good example of faith, right? Because faith does not say we know what will happen. Uh, not to be cliche, but it, well, what it's saying is we, we know the one who does know what will happen and we, we trust in him to take care of us. And so it's a, it's a really beautiful expression of faith. Again, the king is not given to hollow threats and so he chucks him into the furnace. He did it seven times hotter than usual and um, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening and said... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the, notice the name, Most High God, come out, come here. So was Nebuchadnezzar saved? I'm not sure, right? I mean, the, the, the text doesn't actually say that, but when it comes to this polytheistic worldview thinking, even though he might be subscribing to other gods, at least where does he put Yahweh? Right, right here at the top, the Most High God. So... He goes on this time, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They trusted in him, and, uh, and he rescued them. And so I decree, then, that the people of any language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Now, I hope you understand a little bit of how incredibly powerful this is. If you don't understand, just go back with me to the sandbox once again, okay? Here I am. I got my little sand temple built up. It's just perfect. I love it. Billy comes along. Mm, my response this time is, hey, Billy, there's my temple. You want to destroy it? Hmm? Go ahead. In fact, please do. I really would like you to destroy the temple. Would you do that for me? And Billy says, well, no, wait a minute. What's going on here? Why do you want me to do that? And I say, because I think it'd be so cool to see you cut in pieces and your house turned into a pile of rubble. So go ahead. Have at it, right? Destroy the temple. Because if you destroy the temple, that's going to destroy you. Who says, your king, this is the decree that he made. Well, maybe not today, okay? Again, I'll give you another pass. Uh, let's just, no, no, I don't, I think, it's a nice temple you've built there. Yes, it is, isn't it? Next story. This one is a little bit different yet. And this one really focuses on the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. But here's why it's different. Notice the audience this time. To the peoples, nations, and men of every language, right? First story. The religious crowd. Second story, government officials. This time, everybody. Another difference here is that in those first two stories, at the end of the story, that's when the king made the pronouncement. He does it here as well, but he also does it at the very beginning. So notice verse 2. It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and the wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. And so, the vision, which again, we're not going to go into deeply here, but the vision is simply this big, massive, gigantic tree that has big branches. And as it says here, um, the height was enormous. And eventually, as we read down through the verses, it says, the beasts of the air found shade in it, right? Now, you have to imagine yourself in a really, really hot climate where a shade tree is really, really nice. And, and what he's saying is that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, who epitomizes it, is like this, this life-giving tree that has, in some sense, conquered all the kingdoms of the known world, 
and therefore brought peace. Now, in the very same way, a couple hundred years later, the Romans do the very same thing. Greeks do it, Bab uh, Medo-Persians do it too. Uh, but it mo it's most famous with the Romans because they, they do it for so long, and that's where the Pax Romana comes from, right? The Roman peace. So that when you control all these little tribes and all these little countries, what you can do is you can stop all the fighting that goes on back and forth that's so destructive, and you can have a worldwide sort of a kingdom, so you can have worldwide postal service and worldwide roads and worldwide commerce and lots of peace and prosperity. It's a really amazing thing. That's what, that's what Babylon is in its day. It's this big tree that gives shade everywhere. But because of the pride of Nebuchadnezzar, God says, I'm going to cut you down and trim off your branches. So Daniel tells him, oh, king, you are that tree, and you've become great and strong, and your greatness has grown till it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. So 12 months later, he is walking around in his palace, and his pride gets the most of him. Is this not the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and the glory of my majesty? And God says, I, I heard that. Right? So he strikes him down, and he becomes insane. Right? As the sentence says, you'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle seven times or seven years will pass for you until you acknowledge the Most High is sovereign over kingdoms. And immediately it was fulfilled. And so uh, he was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. So you can imagine what this is like then, right? I mean, the, the poor king is out in the fields uh, and thinks he's part of the cattle, right? So ambassadors come. Can we talk to your king? I'm sorry, he's out grazing right now, but <laughs> if you come back in six and a half years, maybe you can talk to him. And in seven years, sure enough, at the end of that time, my sanity was restored. And so then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is the eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And then notice the poetry here, verse 35. This is, this is really powerful stuff. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing, he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, once again, who says verse 35? It's not Daniel. It's Nebuchadnezzar. And here, here's the really beautiful part about this. If you take a look at any systematic theology textbook today and you look up in the index or in the table of contents, the sovereignty of God. I guarantee you Daniel 4.35 will be there. And so you look at that and you think, oh, this comes from Daniel, right? And the answer is, well, it's from the book of Daniel, but Daniel didn't say it. One of the most exalted statements about the sovereignty of God comes from a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. It's absolutely true. So does that helpful? Well, I don't know. Well, let me go back to the sandbox and let me see how that sounds, right? Well, Billy... My buddy comes along, mm, I'm sorry, Billy, you can't destroy that. Why not? Because my God is the ultimate God. His dominion will never end. No one can look at my God and say, what have you done? Who says so? Your cow, oh, your king, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you see? It works. It totally works. But maybe not as even good as the next one here, because the next one is also about the pride of a king. This time, Belshazzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so the kings and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Now, don't miss this. This is it, right? This is the center of the thing. When it comes to the final celebration, I'm going to ask you a question, and I don't want you to miss it. I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to say, what was the event in Daniel's day that caused this book to be written? And you want to know what the right answer is? The right answer is the temple got destroyed. Now, unless I tell people that, nobody gets it because we just don't consider that to be very important. But every literary clue in the book keeps pointing back to that, right? It was that, it was that temple that got destroyed and those goblets that got taken away that we mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 2. Here it is again, and right in the center of the book, Belshazzar is having this big feast, and he wants his concubines to drink wine, and it's not like the royal kitchen has run out of flatware and stemware. This is an incredible religious 
dissing of the God of Israel. Hey, let's, let's do everything we can to insult him. Let's take the articles that came out of that house and let's use them for the party. Right? Now, there are a lot of good reasons why I'm not God, and here's another one. If I were God, and this is what happened, and that little pipsqueak <laughs> had the audacity to say, let's use those, those goblets, that, that's when I would bring out the big guns, right? I'd bring out the tornadoes, the whirlwinds, the earthquakes, tsunamis. I would... <laughs> God says, no, no, there's a better way. Oh, okay, well, what's a better way? God says, this is a case where less is more. And that's exactly what, what God does here. And, and in fact, he writes with a hand comes out of nowhere and simply writes on the wall. And this is so powerful because it's so understated. It's just a wall and just a hand shows up and God writes, Mini, Mini, Tico, you far seen. Which means basically you have been weighed in the scales and you are a lightweight. And, and, and the, the, the word background is so powerful because the word for glory in Hebrew is kavod. It means heavy. It means someone with substance. It comes across in, in almost every language, even in ours, when we say someone, uh, somebody walks in the room and they have gravitas, right? You can see the word with gravity. They have weight. They have substance. So you listen to what they have to say. And God says, you, you have, you've compared yourself to me and you think you're bigger than I am. You're going to use my goblets here? I want you to know you've been weighed in the scales. You have no gravitas. You have no glory. You are a lightweight compared to me. And it's absolutely true because right then, all God does is just write on the wall and the guy's face turns pale. His legs start to shake and his knees knock together and he falls down, right? God says, yeah, there, there's your king right there, right? It's just an amazing understated statement. The fingers of the human hand appear and his knees knock together and his legs gave way. Probably a, a pretty powerful situation to see where the king just melts in front of everybody. So, let's take a look <clears throat> at one more story. Very last story here uh, for right now is Daniel's victory of the lions. I trust that you know it pretty well. <clears throat> they say to Daniel, you can't pray. And Daniel says, well, I can pray. <laughs> and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go up and uh, go up to the second story floor and uh, open up the windows so everybody can see, and I will pray right there. So um, the king who comes to him has been tricked by some, you know, bad advisors. The king really does like Daniel, and he says, me and Daniel, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, they tricked me, and I can't change the law now, but I pray sincerely, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. I hope that's the case. We know that's true because he spends a sort of a sleepless night and he comes back in an anguished voice and says, Daniel, servant of the living God. Notice that he says this. He says this even before he sees Daniel. Daniel, I know you're servant of the living God whom you serve. Has he been able to rescue you from the lions? And of course, you know the answer. And God does rescue him from the lions. It's not just like the lions are not hungry that night and you, it's proven by verse 24 where it says they took the bad guys and threw them in, and the lions were certainly hungry at that point and overwhelmed them. Right? So with this story then, God says, or maybe I should say the king says, King Darius says, here's my decree. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he's the living God. There it is again. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Now, he can't command faith, but he does command fear and reverence. So this is probably the most powerful summative decree that we've got here. So does that play well? I don't know. Let's go back to the sandbox and think about it, right? Billy's coming along. Mm, you say, Billy, you can't do that again. Oh, come on, why not? I say, well, because technically you are not only not able to destroy my sand temple, you are required to respect and honor God. So Billy says, yeah, I get it. I got to help you build a donut. Yeah, you do. Right? And that's exactly where we are. So, so the under, I hope you understand here what's going on. Not only is this, you know, Aramaic, which they totally understand, but it's the language of their culture. It's power, which they understand as well. And so that's why Daniel is such a powerful book written for this people to answer questions that the other books 
weren't trying to answer, but this one totally does. So let's go back and say, what is the only common thread in all the stories? Is it the concept of faith? So is faith in every story, or can you name a story where there is no faith mentioned? Are there any stories where there is no faith? And the answer is yes. Can you tell me which stories? Which story do you find in here that has nothing about faith in it? There's only five, six stories. Which one is it? Yeah, the hand on the wall, right? There, there are no believers in that story, the story of... Belshazzar and the goblets, There's, it's not all about faith. Is it Daniel? Is Daniel in every story? No. I mean, the book is named after him, but it's not really about him, is it? Because where was he when the three guys got thrown into the furnace? Was he out of town on vacation? I don't know. It doesn't really matter because it's not about him. Good Jewish people. No, again, the Belshazzar thing, they're not there. Is it dumb kings? No, there's a lot of dumb kings, but again, I, I, think, I, I think Darius is a pretty good king, right? He's a pretty rational king. Um, is it the same audience? No, it's a different audience every time. What, what is the only common thread in every one of the stories? Not to be too simplistic, but it's what the king says about God, right? It is God himself. He's the only common thread. So what is the essence of this book so far? It is that my God is bigger than your God. Why is that important? Well, because the temple got smashed, and that's the first time this has ever happened where the pagans from the outside felt superior. And so God writes this book of Daniel in order to demonstrate to them, no, this God is powerful. You know, you know when I said to Billy, look, uh, our God isn't weak, this book then proves it. So... My God's bigger than your God. Now, let me, let me just talk to you about this application in my own life or, or, or one of the things that, one of the big lessons that occurs to me, and, and that's this. Have you ever looked at these stories and wished just a few of them would happen today? I mean, you're talking to friends, especially in our Western worldview, who don't believe in anything supernatural. You try and say, no, God really is powerful. And they say, well, how? Prove it. Let's see an example, right? And I just kind of wish that God would do a little fiery furnace or, you know, a lion's den kind of thing or something like that to demonstrate himself powerful, really, really, in a way our, language, our world would understand. And yet, when you take a look at where we were, look at this. When we talk about land and nation leader, we know that right off the bat, God gives us nation, he gives us land. But here's the problem where Daniel is. Where Daniel is in 586 they get kicked out of the land, and the nation has their covenant broken, right? So you're wondering, is God done with us? Deuteronomy 28 has happened. And, of course, Daniel, the book, comes along with an exclamation point and says, no, God is powerful. He's still here. And so for me, you know, in 2020, to, to look and say, man, I just wish I had some Daniel experiences. I wish God would just show up and write something on the wall, right, or do something really, really powerful. I don't know if you've ever felt that impulse or not. I, I certainly have. And then you realize, wait, in the whole scheme of things, you know, there was this little thing that happened in 33 AD, right? Where, where God came along and said, oh, you know what? L let me give you the leader. And so he perfectly plans this out in the perfect time of God. We see the Messiah born, and he lives, and he teaches, and he preaches, and he dies, and he's buried, and he's resurrected. And as Paul says, all the promises of God in him are yes. So if you're coming along here after Daniel's day and think, well, they're not in the land and the nation's not there, is God going to keep his promises? And you take a look at what he does in Jesus, you realize that what he does in Jesus is far more important than what we've ever seen before. In the book of Judges, we ask ourselves, okay, if you've got the land, you've got the nation, but you haven't got the leader, what have you got? Remember the answer to that? If you haven't got the leader, you haven't got anything. And yet God comes along here and gives us the leader and the death and the burial and the resurrection. And I look at that and I think, oh my goodness, do I need a handwriting on the wall? What God has done in Christ is a hundred, a thousand times better than any of the miracles done back here in the book of Daniel. I don't know if that sounds like a hollow answer to you, but if you think about it deeply, that is the ultimate answer here. Do I need a miracle like I saw in Daniel? And the answer is no, I got, I got all the miracles I need in what God has done in Christ. Am I sure he's going to come back? Oh, my goodness. 
If he came the first time, went to all that trouble, ascended into heaven, yes, he's coming back. Is God going to keep his promises to Israel and the land and nation? Yeah, I think so. I'm absolutely sure of that. But here's the point. I don't need any more demonstrations of power. God has given us the ultimate demonstration of the power of God in Christ. And that's not just wishy-washy. That's not just hope so. That's not just a fairy tale. That is absolute true. Far more powerful than what we've seen before. So my God is bigger than your God for sure.